that these countries continue to do quite well with, uh, uh, you know, in comparison with the rest of the uh, global economy. Now, if we look at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a movement from some kind of acronym to alliance. You know, prevalent growth patterns among, among BRICS are actually becoming interdependent. There's a lot of uh, sort of uh, exchange through a variety of economic channels. Though uh, the 230 billion trade that the BRICS now have among themselves is still a small fraction of their overall trade, the amount is growing very fast. In fact, the recent rate is somewhere around 28 to 30 percent per year, which is a very impressive kind of growth rate. Uh, you know these details, so let me not get into that. Uh, different summits. Uh, the most recent sort of development which has happened, which is uh, this 100 billion currency reserve pool as a financial firewall in the context of what's happening uh, sort of with respect to some of the currencies and the hammering that, that they have received basically on account of international speculation. Uh, South Africa, India, and Brazil have been uh, serious victims of that financial hammering. Right? And that is where this idea came up and that, that, that is something which is important. Some of the new uh, sort of ideas, trade and credit in local currencies, uh, collective voice for efforts of multilateral and regional financial institutions for global growth and development, uh, etc. So you can see a number of channels through which the partnership is becoming denser and uh, uh, more serious. You know, so they are taking themselves far more seriously today than let's say about a decade ago. If you look at the sort of areas of worry, as I mentioned, very high growth sure enough, rich nations, all of them have been spending quite a lot on mega events of various kinds, you know, Olympics, World Cup, Commonwealth Games, etc. If you likewise, if you look at some other indicators, for instance, the number of billionaires that uh, uh, these countries are producing today, it is, of course, you know, the rate is pretty impressive. Uh, if you look at the most recent state, you know, state of uh, billionaires in these countries, it has really soared in the last decade. Uh, this is a February 2013 report. In uh, there are 49 billionaires uh, in Brazil with the total wealth of about 300 billion dollars. 97 billionaires from Russia uh, with a total wealth of 380 billion dollars. India provides 109 billionaires, uh, again with a total wealth of 190 billionaires. Uh, sorry, per billion dollars. In fact, two brothers account for roughly 4% of India's GDP. <laughs> right? So that's, uh, China occupies, of course, a very impressive place. Uh, China currently has 147 billionaires with a total wealth of 380 billion dollars. Right? So clearly, if you measure that as a success of what's happening in these economies, it's very impressive. Right? There's, there's nothing that would uh, beat them. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at something very basic, you know, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, something which is used very widely, Human Development uh, uh, Index, uh, uh, look at uh, where they are, uh, Brazil, 85, Russia, in fact, Russia has uh, suddenly improved in the last one year, it actually uh, sort of improved its position from 66 to 55. Right? Otherwise, if you look at a period of almost uh, a decade or so, in fact, it has been uh, going down. Uh, here are these, as you can see, uh, HDI rank. This is 2012 of these countries. Okay, life expectancy at birth, education index, etc. So if you look at most of these, there is no sort of sense as if these are the countries which are which are having phenomenal growth in terms of either their own sort of uh, past or in terms of uh, comparisons across the globe. Uh, in fact, you know. Please notice this, SDI ranks of different countries over time, 91 to 2012. And look at these countries. In fact, they have been slipping down almost all through, except in case, case of uh, Russia, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, during the last one year there is an improvement. But in spite of this tremendous kind of growth which you are, which you are witnessing in these countries, you notice that uh, the situation in terms of some composite number now, that is not a very good index in many ways, sure enough, but nonetheless, it gives you some idea. Uh, 
So what has happened, each one of them is of course, in a sense, I'll take this one minute and wind up, uh, in terms of trying to address the challenges, precisely because of these challenges are also leading to not sort of who was a more spectacular kind of, uh, you know, uh, challenges that the state is confronting. But in a number of less spectacular ways, all kinds of protests, etc. In, in fact, in China, for instance, in 2011, as per official data, there were more than 185,000 incidents of what the government called unrest in rural areas. 185,000. Just think of the number. Unrest, these are officially acknowledged unrest in rural areas. Right? In case of India, we know that there is a huge agrarian crisis which has been long drawn. And um, if you look at their sort of uh, attempts at address these sort of, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, uh, problems emerging from below, there are strategies to sort of uh, address them in piecemeal ways. In some cases, slightly more successful compared to others. Brazil, for instance, as, as was pointed out by you, for instance, the use of minimum wages is really the single most important uh, uh, sort of tool with the help of which the poverty was brought down from uh, around 30% to about 5% or so, 5-6% uh, or so. Uh, in case of China, there is an attempt to look towards the rural areas. So all these policies, so there are differences in terms of how they are addressing uh, these uh, discontents of various, various kinds. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at sort of something very basic, something which is absolutely more basic than anything else. Something like hunger is still a problem in many of these countries, much more so in India than uh, most other countries, but even in other countries that continues to be a problem. Although, as I said in the recent years, uh, through their policies, they have managed to uh, sort of do better in this respect. Uh, this is proportion of undernourished people, etc. So these are some indicators. And basically, the point that I'm trying to make, and in fact, I wanted to talk a little more about India, but we don't have time. If you have any questions later, we can we can talk about that. Basically, this transition, you know, which has uh, this broad neoliberal trajectory, within that, given the economic space, economic muscle that, that, that these countries have, uh, they are trying to take care of some of the problems in piecemeal ways, but fundamentally, the trajectory is wrong. This trajectory is something which essentially benefits the economic elite and benefits them fantastically. And there's no question about that. Now, that elite really has, in a sense, sort of seceded from the rest of the country for all practical purposes in terms of their overall economic well-being, etc. And uh, that is something which we must acknowledge. So if, you're, if you take growth as a marker, clearly these countries are doing exceedingly well. If you take issues such as unemployment rates, issues of vulnerability in labor market and so on, or a kind of uh, quantitative and qualitative issue relating to the world of work, right? In respect of each one of these, things have come under tremendous pressure, right? It's not the case that, you know, there is uh, absolute emissarization. Of course, I'm not suggesting that. But, you know, so the kind of pressure that these countries are uh, experiencing is something which is very significant. And uh, in a Gramscian framework of thinking in terms of some uh, you know, passive revolution, so to say, within that, you know, how do you sort of try and make some attempt at addressing the concerns of what is a major challenge here and now? Now, that is what they look at. But this trajectory is something which is fundamentally unsustainable. This is something which is fundamentally exclusionary and uh, sort of it's a matter of, uh, I guess, time where we will notice that very significant uh, pressures will be, you know, there on the state and the state will have to, you know, deal with that. As I said, in China, we, we, we talk of this problem in the rural areas. In, in case of India, there's a gradient crisis. South Africa, unemployment is 40% or so and uh, so on. So, you know, this is, this is, unequalizing kind of growth trajectory uh, in terms of its impact on a whole range of well-being indicators. And, uh, how that uh, gets sorted out is the major challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. I, uh, I really think we, we are still debating on 
um, dispensable lives. You know? Us as academics are quite dispensable academics from the south, uh, and uh, we have um, something to talk. <laughs> Thank you for being. Now we we'll have Professor Jianan Huo. Um, uh, he's also an economist uh, from the South and Western University of Economics and Finance. Uh, and uh, he will talk uh, about um, Guangxi and income inequality in China. Okay. Um. I know it's been said sometimes since the seminar begins two days ago, but I still need to express my uh, personal gratitude to Professor Castelbo and his team for the impressive organization of this excellent conference. And I also want to thank to Chair Lady, Chair Lady, and Andrew Nadia for bringing all of us together this interesting panel, uh, for which I'm still immersed myself into the uh, my panel colleagues' talks. So now I need to bring back my thought and present to you um, some of my research results. Um, uh, I, I, I know inequality is a big issue, is a big issue, but um, I didn't uh, look, uh, look at it through such a broad scope like uh, Florin, Mario, and other colleagues did. Um, I, I, focus, I focus on inequality in China and with our uh, new tackling point, which is the, the Guanxi that uh, might be a new a new, a new funded contributor to the involvement of inequality in China. Uh, so, first of all, let me uh, uh, briefly outline what I'm going to talk about. Okay, my, uh, my findings I are mainly uh, based on our uh, brand new data set, which is called the Chinese Household Financial Survey, conducted by my department. Uh, the Research Institute of Economic Management and the Subi, of Subi University. And uh, from this data, uh, I will first uh, uh, present to you some of the new findings in inequality and then bring out uh, our conceptual uh, framework of what is Guanxi and then uh, state our methodology of how to research Guanxi with inequality and the new findings in inequality. Uh, so first of all, what is the CHMS data? I know uh, that uh, for, for, for research on China's problem, uh, especially Chinese economy, data is always